Good morning still, I guess it is. Um, and welcome to the second session in the ISOCC track. Um, and this one is called Internet Governance, the End of the Beginning. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Churchill quote. Um, if not, you can Google it. I'd like to, to welcome uh, the panelists of this session up to the stage. As you, because we, we've got, we don't have too much time, it's an hour session, which is already uh, a little bit too short, I think, for, for these discussions. And um, I'm going to start introducing the panellists as they get on stage. So the tall gentleman to the left is Olaf Kolkman. Olaf is um, with the NL, um, sorry, I'll bring it up. NLNet Labs, and he's also um, a former chair of the IAB. Um, so that's sort of a steering committee for the IETF, the, the, tech, uh, the, the standards body uh, in the technical community. Um, he's also been heavily involved with the IETF and chaired several working groups. But he's one of these rare finds. He's, he's a geek, but someone who understands policy and, and the other world. He's also a drumist. Uh, the next, next to uh, Olaf, you'll find Jusso Moisander. He is with the Foreign Ministry of Finland. He's al also into old cars. And he's also been involved with the WISES uh, and the IGF process, so the whole internet governance process for many years, since, since the very early beginnings. He's also he's headed up the, the Finnish Internet Governance Forum, and he also used to be on, on the GAC, so the Government Advisory Council to ICANN. And lastly, we've got the lovely Henriette from South Africa, who uh, works for APC, uh, Association for Progressive Communication. She's also a very passionate um, uh, member of this uh, sort of community of Internet Governance people, uh, who often a member of the civil society um, um, stakeholder group, and she's also been a key player in, in, in uh, uh, parts of Africa and helping connect parts of Africa. She's actually also a member of the Internet Hall of Fame for all her fantastic work there. So um, today, the, 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 the topic we'll discuss is basically internet governance. Where are we? And I'm, I'm quite excited to see that there's so many people in the room, because normally when you see internet governance in a title, people start looking a little bit sleepy and distracted. But I think um, if you, if you want to say something good about some of the, the recent revelations with, for example, NSA, um, I think what has happened is that um, it has actually gotten a lot of people passionate about governance. Uh, they realize that this internet thing that we all participate in is more than just Facebook and, and uh, Twitter, and it's something that we all have a stake in. And maybe we should all actually participate in, in, in the discussions about it. Um, so I would say that internet governance has happened since, since the internet started. Uh, since it was an early research project in the 1970s. Um, but, of course, uh, for a very long time, it was um, some passionate technical people who, who, who managed the Internet, so to speak. But as it developed, um, there was an increased notion of governance, that we needed policies to manage resources, for example, IP addresses and AS numbers. How should we govern them? Standards, for example, who should be allowed to participate in standards development? So I would say that the, the concept of internet governance is, is quite an old one, but, but it's something that was defined sort of in recent years. And I guess it started with this funny acronym, WISES, the World Summit on, on the Information Society, which was a UN process that started up in 2003. And all of a sudden, um, some of us were surprised by how interested the UN was in, 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 in the internet. This resulted in, in um, 2005, something that became the Internet Governance Forum, which is sort of a, a, a discuss, discussion point where all these different stakeholders come together to discuss internet governance. Um, so I will, I will start with that quick introduction, and I'm, uh, I would like to have a very interactive discussion. Uh, throw up your hands if you, if you want to ask a question. If you're shy, you can tweet it. Um, 
And um, I will we'll start by, by asking the panelists, so what is inter internet governance to you and why really should we care about it? Um, thanks, Narani. Um, I think internet governance has been around for a, for a very long time. So for me, coming from Africa, um, for a long time, internet governance was all about telecommunications regulation and, and not having access to infrastructure in order to use the internet and getting policymakers to make decent policies that would um, increase infrastructure, reduce cost, for me, was internet governance. And I think it still is in, in, in a large part of the world. I think that this notion of internet governance being this special, exceptional space where we are all in it, together, believing in the same things. It's kind of a construction. It is a, a bit of a post wishes um, construction. And I think it's been very interesting and very exciting. And it can allow us to look at new ways of doing governance. But I think, in response to your question, where are we now? I think we are, as the previous panel, actually, I think, was coming to the point that how do we keep this internet free, open, and fair without actually governing it? And, and, you know, and we have this, this no regulation mantra and, and self-regulation, no regulation, government's hands off the internet. But aren't we at a stage now that if we want the internet to be open, free and fair, we actually do need um, some norms and, and, and rules and regulations. So I think that is kind of the, the critical point that we are at at the moment. You, sir. Thank you. Um, I think as a government representative here, I have to stick to the WISIS definition of what is internet governance. <laughs> but for me, it's, it's, um, it's as Andrea said, a new, new way to govern the backbone of the economy, which is the internet. So uh, it's definitely all about multi-stakeholderism and how to take it forward. Um, uh, I, I actually don't know how to answer that, that answer. I, I do not know what, what internet governance is. Um, the the way that I look at, at 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 internet and the way it's governed is by um, using two terms, uh, different players at different layers, which is a sort of technical uh, phrase that separates the players in the application space, the people that make things, from the people that build infrastructure and the people that. Uh, 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 provide the binding layer between those two. Um, and the second phrase is uh, collaboration uh, uh, where, where needed and competition where possible, or just the other way around, competition where, po uh, where needed and collaboration where, where possible. That is, groups of people that come together and solve a problem um, that, that, that is relevant for them. If you combine that, uh, that could be access, uh, uh, broadband access regulated at a national level, for instance. It can be uh, management of a shared resource like uh, IP addresses on regional basis or um, the uh, management of, of the root zone at a, at a higher level. It's also standardization in many standards, uh, standards groups where people come together. So for me, internet governance is this diffuse place of people coming together, solving their particular problems uh, in, a, in an open process where, where, where everybody who has a stake can, can come in and, and, and collaborate. Different players at different layers, I like it. Um, so you've all touched upon this, this, uh, this word, multi-stakeholderism, say that ten times fast in a row. Um, and it's, it's one of these things that at the very early beginnings of, of these internet governance discussions, it was, it was rather new, well some would argue it was a new concept. In, in government circles it was certainly a new concept and others would argue that uh, multi-stakeholderism is the model that, that has made the internet the success it is today. And, uh, but there were a lot of discussions about this thing, about all these different stakeholders coming together to discuss and do we really need that? And, Really, do we need governments? Can't we just let the technical people sort it out? And the governments are saying, really, do we need all these technical people? We know what's best for, for, for our nations. Um, but I think we've come to a point where, where multi-stakeholderism is used. It's one of these, you can't talk about governance without using the term multi-stakeholderism. You have to throw it in at least once. Um, so does that mean that we all agree? Is, is, have we found this perfect model now? We've, we've all, we all agree 
that we need this multi-stakeholder model with all these different stakeholders. And, and is that the solution? Have we come to a point of equilibrium now in, when it comes to internet governance? Um, I don't think so. In fact, I think we've, we've only really just come to the point where um, we need a, um, I think on the one hand, uh, hopefully maintaining that spirit of the, of the notion of the internet being um, something that belongs to us all and that is developed by a combination of individuals and activists and techies and hackers and businesses and, and, and governments. All. Um, so I think that, 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 uh, that is important. It's an important cultural attribute, I think, of the internet community. But at the same time, I think um, we need to now be it a, we need to, um, it's a more diffuse kind of, of approach that we need now um, in order to differentiate what needs to happen when. And I think the, the discussion of surveillance is a good example of that. You know, there are responses, the t uh, technical community can respond in a particular way. Um, but ultimately, we need um, transparency, we need norms, we need governments to agree to principles, we need a change in practice, we need it at a global level, we need it at a national level or a regional level such, such as in Europe. And I think that the, the trick now of multi-stakeholder uh, approaches in internet governance is how do we come together as a multi-stakeholder community but actually agree on norms and accountabilities and processes that apply in very specific ways to very specific players in this arena. And I think that is not as simple as it might sound. I agree uh, with Henriette. I, I think that there is no question about the, the fact that multi-stakeholderism is the way forward. But what is multi-stakeholderism? Then you have as, as many views as you, as you have respondents. So multi-stakeholderism is, is something that, that every single culture takes, takes from their own background and, and interprets it in, a, in, in, in their own way. And, and also Every, um, every stakeholder group, like the governments, view their respective role differently. So that's my answer. Just as I, uh, I'm going to be boring, I'm going to give the same answer as just a minute ago. I do not know what it is. Um, uh, uh, again, in, in some, in some Can environments... Can you say it fast, though? Uh, when, when I, no, even when I say... say I do not know because that's not my la that's not my <laughs> native language. Um, oh, we had an ICANN meeting um, uh, last week in Argentina, and somebody said that uh, multi-stakeholderism is bad for their nutritional value, um, given the amount of stakes you have in Argentina. That made sense. Um, uh, that aside, um, no, I don't know what it is because it's interpreted in many different ways. Uh, if if you look at uh, 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 some environments, multi-stakeholderism means that. Um, uh, for instance, your, your proposed decision is open for comments on a public website. And uh, at the end, the, 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 the entity proposing the, 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 the solution basically s declares whatever the consensus is or it takes in what, 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 what they take in from what's fed back. In other systems, there is a consensus model. Um, I've, I've been working in the ITF for many, many years. Um, there, the decision is based. Uh, the final decisions is based on uh, on consensus in a very pr particular way. That works in that environment. Um, and by the way, everybody may contribute. Not only technical people, but also people from from a from a more civil background. But it works in that that environment because often the arguments are based on on technical merit with a shared goal uh, for outcome. Um, that type of consensus process might not work in other occasions, like where ethics and uh, aesthetics are involved. Um, then um, the, the decision models are usually quite different um, because the opposition is structured in a different way. Mm. Um, so multi-stakeholder to me is, is, again, something that applies to your to your local collaboration model uh, in, in different ways. And I, I believe that um, uh, openness is key to that. Um. Okay, interesting. Uh, I mean, 
personally, I'm someone who's, who, who has participated in, in, inter in the internet governance process for a long time. And, and I, uh, and this particularly the Internet Governance Forum, I, I see, I feel that it, that it has matured, that um, the discussions are actually a lot richer than they were in the early days, that the fact that we know stakeholders from the, the stakeholders from the other groups, that we have more sort of honest debate and less sort of political rhetoric. Um, but at the same time, so, so, you know, it's easy to think that, you know, we're all sort of moving in, in, in one direction, but then, you know, from time to time, there are, there are indications that pop up that not everyone is, is happy with this process. I think the World Conference on International Telecommunications, WICKET, that, that took place last year was one of those where, where all of a sudden there was a lot of controversy. Uh, the idea of multi-stakeholderism um, was raised again uh, in, in what does it actually mean to, to involve um, non-governments in, in government discussions. Um, there have been several proposals on the tables in various forums along the way where there were talks about, uh, there was a proposal from uh, some countries saying that they wanted this UN body that sits on top of, at the top of the UN that sits on top of all sort of the, on top of ICANN, on top of all these other technical organisations that should sort of over, have the oversight and overlook um, internet governance in, in the whole world. Um, and then... Recently, there have been, been um, developments to with the technical community coming up with this Montevideo statement uh, talking about the increased need for internationalization of, of ICANN and, and, um, and that we need to um, further develop... Let me see if I can find the wording. Um, we need to... Um, the, the evolution of multi global multi-stakeholder internet cooperation. That sounds great, but what does that mean? Um, and then there, there have also been recent developments this, this autumn where they've been, talk, uh, they've, they've been talking about this uh, meeting in Brazil where we will sort of bring internet governance to the next level. But what, what, what does this actually mean? Where are we now? Does this mean that we're at a crossroads at the moment? And what's at stake, really? I actually, I, mean, I think we've, it's matured at the level of conversation. I think, speaking as someone from civil society and someone who's been an activist in my youth and probably always will be, I feel I've learned from this process to interact with governments in a different way, uh, not just assuming that they are the enemy and, and, that, and, and same thing with business. So I think certainly as someone from civil society, I've learned a lot from working in this environment. I think, though, that are we really achieving anything? You know, I think uh, Olaf said players at layers. I think there's so many layers um, in the internet, and they're converging. The old idea of you have the transport layer and the application layer and the content layer doesn't really work anymore. Not if you are somewhere in Kenya and you access the internet through your mobile phone from a mobile ISP who basically does everything the government asks it to do, whether it's formal or informal. Um, so I think, you know, and I think, I think we kind of keep talking around the issue, but look at real things. Look at torrenting, for example, and, and downloading file download sites, you know, Pirate Bay, for example. Um, um, will a multi-stakeholder internet governance community reach consensus? On, on an issue like that, when it comes to intellectual property enforcement, is there consensus really on that? When it comes to um, certain telecommunications regulatory issues, do we really achieve consensus? How, do, how has data access rates in the mobile industry gone down through competition and through re regulatory intervention? And, and where there is no competition, you need regulatory, regulatory intervention to create that com competition. So I think we talk around the issue. I think where consensus is possible is at a level of principles. And I think, it's, I think if we really want to challenge ourselves as a multi-stakeholder internet governance community, that's the thing that we should really be producing. You know, if we can't produce some common, fairly high-level principles about how we think the internet should be governed, you know, like they've done in Brazil, for example. That, that's a good starting point. It still won't solve, because power, and I think that's the thing. I think we tend to talk about multi-stakeholder governance, and we don't talk about power, and I think, as Amelia said, we don't talk 
about um, accountability. And I think an interesting analogy is the environment and the oil industry, for example. You know, we know that BP shall finance a lot of environmental protection, but there are also companies that, if they had not been regulated and if they're not increasingly going to be regulated, they will cause enormous harm. Not because they are evil companies, but because it's in the nature of their business and that it challenges um, um, the impact um, on the, the impact on the environment uh, is challenged by their business. And I think we have similar issues like that in the internet. So at some point, I hope we really do get to grip. Taxation, I think, that's the other one that we haven't even started talking about. Yeah, um, a lot of acronyms, a lot of questions. Um, let's start with the IGF. I agree with you that the IGF has matured. Uh, it gained a lot of, uh, again, back a lot of the relevance that it might have lost last year or the year before this year with the, with the discussions around surveillance. But at the same time, the IGF is, is uh, it's, it's so comprehensive that there's so, lo so, so many issues on the table that it's actually quite hard for me to anymore to grasp what's really on the agenda. I mean, I follow a certain track, and we probably follows another one. We meet, we might not meet during the days. Uh, we, we might be discussing all about the Brazilian proposal, for me, from a different angle than, than for, for Andriette. So th there's a lot going on in, in internet governance, and I think that uh, 2014 will be um, a decisive year on the future of internet governance. And uh, I, the title of this panel was The End of the Beginning. I'm not sure if it's the beginning of the end. <laughs> But, uh, um, IGF, I cannot talk too much about. I've never been to an IGF. Um, uh, but I think I can say something about the Montevideo statement. Um, uh, because I'm a little bit more familiar with the, uh, the, the organizations that were in Mont Montevideo. So the Montevideo statement came out of a, a, a meeting between the uh, CEOs and the chairs of the various ISTAR organizations. ISTAR organizations being the regional internet registries, ICANN, ITF, um, IAB, W3C. Um, standards and those who manage IP addresses yes. and uh, one of the one of the shared interest within that space is the IANA registry. The IANA registry um, has basically three legs. Um, it has the domain name lag, it has the IP addresses uh, lag, and it has protocol parameters lags. So f f ICANN is there to sort of coordinate that, um, and there is an, uh, 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 that is done on the contract from the USG. So the USG d determines where uh, IANA is, is, is hosted, who, is, who has the contract. Um, USD also has a very specific role in uh, root zone updates. This is maybe a little bit technical, but there is a, a strong oversight component from the USG into this IANA function. This IANA function is relevant for global addressing, global DNS, and internet standards. And it, and it, and it has to do with basically what top-level domains, .sc, .net, .org, yes. etc., yes. that are allowed yeah. in the domain. So I can develop policies, um, the RRRs, the regional internet registries develop policies, and the ITF essentially develop policies for, for f putting the information in these databases. It's basically a set of tables. Now, of course, um, it is sort of weird, it's a fact of history, so to speak, that, that the US government has a very specific role in this. And the Montevideo statement was really about how do we create um, a, a, a governance structure so that that function, the IANA function, is accountable um, towards the rest of the world, um, to, to the global public, to the, to the stakeholders, whatever you want to call it, and get minimize the, the, the involvement of the US, US government in that. So, uh, and that's not something new. It's been said uh, a few times um, over the last few years going, going, uh, go, going back by the several organizations that lesser involvement of the USG was important to them. So that's the background of the Montevideo statement. Um, Brazil is something that happened. Um, I, I actually do not know, but it sort of appeared out of thin air and suddenly we had uh, a conference. Um, 
Leading up to uh, that conference, initiative was taken also by the people involved in the in the in the in the uh, Montevideo group, so to speak, uh, to set up an initiative called OneNet. The OneNet initiative intends to develop. Um, and onenet.org is the website, intends to develop a set of principles going into um, uh, the Brazil conference. Third um, is, uh, with respect to the Brazil conference, is that um, ICANN has set up, or catalyzed, as they call it themselves, a panel of uh, 15 people from different blood groups, so to speak, um, that is also going to uh, uh, try and, and, and get a set of principles as input to the Brazil meeting. Now, I assume that in that Brazil meetings there will be many principles to choose from. Um, and and uh, in, in that sense it's going to be interesting. But my understanding of the Brazil conference is that it will be about what type of principles do we want for internet uh, governance, governance and, and um, being there, so to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, um, yes, I'm going to I'll let you answer, then I'll throw two questions to, for anyone to answer, and then I'd like to get questions from the audience. So if you're sitting on a question, then, then uh, start formulating it in your head. Thank you. Uh, a comment on Olaf's uh, intervention on, on the Brazil initiative. Of course, working with the WSIS process, it's, it's a big question for, still for me, what the Brazilian initiative really has to do with, with WSIS, what's the relation to WSIS? Uh, what kind of uh, the, the one that... Uh, coalition of the grassroots movement is, is of course a positive thing to develop principles to the uh, to the conference but honestly i don't know if the uh, if the icon panel is there a link between between the brazilian initiative and this or whether the brazilians are free to use uh, whatever the panel produces as an input to the uh, to, yeah, to the con as far as i understand there's no formal uh, commitment to use whatever comes out of that panel so that's my limited understanding there a quick reaction to yes. That. I think that in itself, I think all of uh, you explained that trajectory, but in a way that's also a story of power and power dynamics in, in the internet field. There are principles that have been around for a long time. Um, there are principles that were developed in the context of the IGF. The, there's a coalition, a multi-stakeholder coalition, internet rights and principles. But instead of actually building on that, which in fact the Brazilian Internet Steering Group did when it developed its statement of principles, the technical community broadly and the, the business community, who are the powerful actors, um, more powerful even than governments in many cases, are starting this initiative without, in my view, really respecting or building on what has, has gone before. And, and then that you know, puts the credibility of this so-called bottom-up OneNet um, initiative to question. So, so the OneNet is really a, a, an open canvas, as, as I've been led to understand. And if you go to the OneNet uh, uh, web pages uh, or the mailing list, you actually see that there is really nothing there. Um, I've done that. Uh, uh, there is really nothing there. People are trying to 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 find the common ground and, and try to build upon something. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop you because I think we are yeah, getting sorry. a little bit geeky, internet governance geeky. Uh, whether or not we want to admit it, we are sort of in internet governance geeks. And there are lots of uh, references here that the audience might not be familiar with. Um, I, want to, I want to throw uh, two questions at you. Uh, one is, um, why should they care about what, what you are talking about up here? The second question is uh, trying to play devil's advocate a bit. Um, have we shown that the multi-stakeholder model, this great model where everyone can participate, the man on the street, the technical community, business, civil society, government, um, that that model actually doesn't work? Because clearly there are players who are not happy in this process. Uh, there are development, developing country voices saying that multi-stakeholder model works. Great, everyone participates in equal footing, but there is no equal footing. You, you end up having those with resources who are uh, participating and the rest of us uh, don't. Um, 
the NSA revelations, for example, US government have been one of the, the champions of the multi-stakeholder model. That sounds great in theory, but then look what, what happens behind the, behind the scene. Uh, again, the digital divide, multi the multi-stakeholder model hasn't solved the digital divide, has it? So those two questions, why should we care? And does, have we not proven that it's broken? Don't we need something else? Um, I think we should care because we all use the internet. And, and I think at the moment, you know, when we talk about internet governance and uh, sometimes it's terribly technical, it's about names and numbers. Um, but in fact, when we're talking about internet governance, it's any policy making, in my view. And I think the, the established definitions are quite broad. And so that does uh, mean it's going to affect whether you can download movies or music or share. I think in the previous, this morning, one of the, uh, the keynote speakers, um, John Obono, talked about sharing. Um, and I think internet governance is changing how we share information. Um, you can buy music legally um, through iTunes, but it's hell of a difficult to figure out how you share that. I might be wrong, I don't use Apple. But, um, but so I think it changes uh, uh, how we use the internet and how we behave as humans on the internet, so it matters to everyone. Is it broken? I don't think it's broken. I think as of most problem solving uh, um, um, experiences, if it's quite localized, if it's a group of people that come together to solve a particular problem, um, you're going to have a better solution if it's multi-stakeholder. And I think you have examples of that. I think at a big picture level, when you look at global regulation and, and, and the kind of interplay between content regulation and access regulation, it's not working um, that well at the moment. But that doesn't mean we should, we should stop. I just think we need to, to, do, to do it better. And I think this, you know, these challenges don't just apply to internet governance. It applies to more inclusive participative policy making in the world at large. Yeah, why should they care? Um, everybody should care. It's about your internet. Um, and I'd like to say that multi-stakeholderism begins at home. So if you participate in your own national uh, decision-making processes in a multi-stakeholder fashion, as we here in the Nordic countries at least do have them functioning, that's a way of, of, of giving input to the, to the regional and the global processes. And I, I think it is important for everyone to participate. We just talk about the flying circus here on the global level, but it starts at home. Um, if the multi-stakeholder doesn't work or not, or if it does, I think that it does. It, it, if you have a better model, please prove it. I mean, going back to the previous panel, it's, it's the optimal model, and let's work on it. It's still young. I mean, the, the development is so fast, and if you look at how long it took to develop democracies, and how long we've been governing the internet with, with, with a multi-stakeholder model, we're just in the beginning. The beginning of the beginning? <laughs> Do we care? Should we care? Yes, we should care. This, this, this amazing thing called the internet, um, I hope it will cha shape my children as it shaped me. Um, I think it's very, very important to keep that internet thing vibrant, open, um, make sure that innovation is possible at each, each level, um, uh, make sure that new telcos can, can, can gain markets, new Googles can uh, invent themselves, and even uh, a new internet uh, protocols, a, a new World Wide Web can grow um, uh, uh, over, over the internet. Um, and in order to do that, um, I, I think we need to be very careful with rules and regulations. That said, um, it is also a, a public commons. It's a place that we need to keep clean for each other in order to, to keep it valuable. Um, and, and sometimes regulation is needed in, in, in spaces, in global commons, to, to keep it clean. Um, that said, I don't think that a centralistic model, centralistic global model, is the answer in, in that. And it seems that um, some of the pushes around uh, the forthcoming Plenipot and, um, and, and the other ITU fora um, 
there are voices there that say, let's, let's get this thing centralized. Let's make sure that we have a multi-stakeholder process with oversight by the UN, by the nation states in the UN, which is centralization. To me, that sounds like a, a one solution fits all, and um, it's usually based around um, uh, arguments like, if we have centralized governance, we can solve global problems problems like internet security, like spam, like all these other things um, that are said not to be addressed, but actually are addressed, but are so damn difficult that they're not solved yet. Um, so do we need internet governance? Yes, we do. Do the current models like IGF work? Work might be a good word, uh, uh, not a good word, but um, do they have the ability to evolve? I think yes, and I think that evolution is, is one of the things that, that built the internet, and as long as we maintain that, we should be fine. So what I'm hearing is that you, you're all saying that the multi-stakeholder model isn't perfect, uh, and it's painful at times, but, but, but it's, it's what we've got, and other models have not proven to be more um, useful or, or successful. Can I respond quickly to Olaf? I agree with Olaf completely about centralization <laughs> not being um, the answer. But there's another reason why I agree with that, aside from the ones you mentioned, and that is that the internet is not a parallel dimension. The internet is part of the world that we live in. And when it comes to the enforcement of human rights and free speech, for example, on the internet, we have mechanisms, we have institutions. They're imperfect, but we're still trying to make them work. And setting up alternative ones for protecting freedom on the, on, on the uh, internet could actually just create or undermine those, those initiatives and those mechanisms that we try to use to protect human rights and free speech in the offline world mm. as well. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I want to take, what I want to do is I want to take a few questions from the audience. I know we have at least three uh, hands here. I want to see if there are any questions on Twitter. And then an, another question there. Uh, and I, I just want to take all of them at once and then you can choose to, to um, respond uh, more interactively to them. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jacob Dexer. I'm from the Swedish think tank Forest. Um, I, I, I w would like to synthesize some of the questions asked on Twitter. Um, the discussion completely died off in the last 15 minutes. Uh, we're in a room with a lot of really initiated people. Uh, they usually know what they're talking about, yet somehow the, the comments completely stopped uh, about this very complicated topic. We're talking about a lot of different players on the different layers. Uh, we're talking about multi-stakeholders and the multitude of stakeholders. And we're talking about a concept that people don't really seem to understand, even though everybody is talking about it. And I say that I'm working with it, I don't understand it. How can we make a concept such as internet governance and the multitude of different questions and actors in that area why, why can't we make that understandable? Why, why is it so hard for a room with really, really smart people to just completely go silent? M may I? <laughs> but but uh, can uh, I just get, if, okay, please oh, respond. I, no, because <laughs> you just, you know, I remember my t first two answers. I don't know. I don't know what multi-stakeholderism is. I don't know what internet governance is. The thing is, your heart ticks for something. You're here because it ticks for something. You want to address an issue. Where do you go with that issue? Do you know where to go with... What is your issue? What, what makes you go? What makes you get into this room? Net neutrality, usually. Net neutrality. So where do you go to speak about this issue? And discuss this. So. And, and that, is, that is an incredibly valued contribution to, to a global debate and might influence local policymakers or might influence uh, uh, people in the EU to, to, to take on regulation. And I think that is, that is the essence of, of internet governance. You have an issue and you take it to a place where you can actually contribute and your voice is heard. And Centra you're, you are just asking for centralization. Where can we go? 
And if we start to answer that question, like where can we do go, we might end up with the, the Global Institute for Internet Governance, what have you. And that's probably not the right answer. Yeah, so maybe we're, two conclusions, maybe we're not as much as he thinks we are. And secondly, maybe it's difficult to understand simply because it's complex. I, I think we're more than we think we are. I think we avoid the real issues like net neutrality. <laughs> net neutrality, in my view, is the number one internet governance issue. But we tend to, in this multi-stakeholder space, we, we tend to be more polite to one another um, than we should be. So because is that a cost of the, uh, the multi-stakeholder model? I think model. that's the price. I think it takes... It takes a lot. I don't think many people are able to manage the multi-stakeholder environment uh, um, in a way to build cooperation as well as to deal with contestation. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think this, this creates an environment which is quite boring. And only when a real issue breaks out, like the surveillance revela re revelations, do people actually begin to fight and contest and talk about the real power and different issues. I think that's why we're so boring, because mm. we're too polite. Mm. Okay, I want to. I want to. So let's let's get a bit less boring then. I, I know there's a question from Maria. And then maybe we can go to Robin. I know Emily had a question. If there, there's anyone else, please raise your hand now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Maria Hall, and I'm working as the CEO for the Swedish University Network Sunet. Anyway, I just had a comment and a, and a question actually, but I think that you so in a way actually answered my question because I think. The multi-stakeholder model is not something, as far as I see, and as, as I think, it's not something separate. It's, it's a way of working. It's a day-to-day -day process when you kind of collaborate with, with the colleagues in other sectors and try to make your decision the best possible. It's also about mutual understanding. I mean, the, the technical community is going to make much more or better decisions if they or we understand how governments work, how the processes are, you know, going and, and also the other way around governments are going to take much better decisions along uh, legislation and other things if they understand how the technical community works and whatever but that needs to happen on a day-to-day -day ba basis like, as you also said and, uh, and I think that is actually one of the problems it's kind of becomes a, a separate issue we're talking about the internet governance here but I would like to, to that be part of you know, the day-to-day -day life, actually, that we have a better dialogue continuously. Mm. Thank you. Robin. Thanks. Uh, Robin Wilton again, and I, I hesitate to take more airtime, air but um, I did want to comment. Um, uh, I met Henriette in Baku at the last IGF, well, no, the last but one, um, and I think that illustrated that, that IGF in general illustrated some of the strengths but also some of the weaknesses of the multi-stakeholder approach. And I think we need to be realistic about what those weaknesses are. Um, there are some players who will never respond to the fact that a multi-stakeholder dialogue is taking place. Um, the hope of holding the IGF in Baku was that it would encourage the regime there to behave more responsibly um, and to show that it was interested in joining a community that behaved that way. It really didn't work in that sense. Um, having said that, I found it a fascinating experience to go there and see uh, a week of sessions that were open to everyone, um, regardless of the interest that they represented or brought to the room. The thing that I found strange and in a way disturbing in that context was that the ministerial sessions still happened behind closed doors. And when there was a plenary with the ministers talking, they sat on the stage and we listened. And I found that really jarring in the context of the IGF. I think it would be enormously um, healthy for them if they opened those sessions up and didn't turn up to the same place as us, but sit behind closed doors. Okay, so... Um Emily, I just want to say, as, as you are walking, that one of the things that I thought, that I think is exciting about this multi-stakeholder model, if we want to talk about it exciting, uh, was that at the last IGF, I was allowed in a room and I could ask questions to the US government and Google and um, the chair of the IETF, the standards body, 
about surveillance and there were some tough questions in that room and they were asked, answered. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a session where, you know, where all the difficult questions were dodged. That's what I think is, is pretty cool because I would not be involved, uh, invited to some of those discussions in the US. I, I agree with you and I think that the US delegation were very courageous and open in turning up and saying, here, we are going to answer these questions. Unlike, I must say, the British minister who just made uh, comments about how many Twitter followers the um, Indonesian president had. That was his contribution to the surveillance debate. So I think that, but, but I think it, your remark points up, and I, I'm sorry, like Robin, to hog the microphone again, um, apologies, but the, the loss of credibility and moral standing of the, two, of the major advocates of multi-stakeholder governance from, from the, which is Western democracies, the US, UK, even Sweden, I have to say. And, and, and that during this sort of hiatus when we've all been running around the world uh, reveling in this multi-stakeholder dialogue, there's been allegedly mass surveillance undertaken by those very Western democracies. And so to retain the credibility of multi-stakeholderism, I think that we have to challenge ourselves to answer some difficult questions about what it can deliver and what it can't deliver. You know, under pressure, Google and Facebook are talking about needing harmonization of laws globally. That cannot be delivered other than by legislature, I think. So mm. I'd just like your response on that. Thank you. Anyone care to respond to that? Yeah, the, the first observation there, um, uh, not an answer, but um, when we talk about governance in these circles, um, usually uh, we're talking about Janus-faced uh, entities that um, from an economic side are all for the open internet and, and so on and so forth, and from a national security perspective are more for surveillance and what have you. Um, and if it comes to that particular layer, so uh, governance and uh, governments, um, I think we, as stakeholders in our local governments, we have to help hold our governments accountable and transparent. And you, know, you just had a beautiful session about that aspect. Um, um, I think that's also an important uh, 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 part of this, this whole cycle. Um, we should not only look at the internet, but also from the internet to, to our, our current day society. Internet is not a different world. It is us participating on different scales and different things, but it's still us together doing our day-to-day -day things, um, subject to our legislative inner surroundings. Um, yes, I, 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 I agree with that. I think, Emily, the answer to your question is yes. I think at some level, it will require um, legislative change. Now, this doesn't have to be brand new legislation. It could be legislation that um, um, emphasizes states' responsibilities, uh, which they already have to protect fundamental human rights, such as privacy and freedom of expression, um, rights that exist um, within the international and national framework. So the, the internet governance piece can become how do we make that really happen? And, and how do we deal with um, collusion between states and collusion between states and companies? And, and, you know, so, so I think at some point, yes, it does require um, uh, um, intervention. I think centralized intervention, I agree with Olaf, I'm very concerned about that because I think uh, we experience the internet in a decentralized way and I think centralizing its governance um, could be quite complicated. As, you know, in response to Robin, I think multi-stakeholder, uh, and I really do believe in it, even though I sound skeptical, but I think it's because it's a means to an end. And I think the end is more inclusive, more democratic, more accountable internet governance. I think what's happened to us, and maybe that's also why we're so boring, is that we talk about multi-stakeholder as the en end. Mm. And, 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 and it's not. And I think we should remember that. And then I think just to, to the, you know, it really is about citizen engagement. We live in a world where we're trying to be more aware as consumers. Um, you know, you have a company like H&M, 
which I actually buy my children's clothes when I come to Europe because it's cheaper than what I pay in South Africa. But cheap clothing comes at a cost of cheap labor. And, and yet European consumers are engaging that, maybe not adequately, but they're asking questions of companies about the production of that clothing. And I think that also has to apply to the internet. I think we don't engage the internet. It's like this entity, it's out there. If you were born into it, you just take it for granted. And I think the challenge is for us to ask as citizens, as users, questions about the internet, about how it's governed, how the money um, that's developing it is being made. So I think that's why it becomes an important uh, issue for every responsible citizen. Um. I'll, I'll make a few comments on the two gentlemen's questions here. Uh, firstly, on, on uh, people who understand the, the concept of internet governance, I know it. Uh, I've been running the national IGF in Finland for something like four years, um, and we've been trying to engage our stakeholders on, on discussions on, on internet-related issues. And honestly, it's hard. I mean, we have an audience. When we want to talk, we have an audience. But if, if we invite them to, to set up the agenda, it's really, really hard to come up with people who, who, who want to discuss these certain issues. It, it doesn't have to relate to international aspects of internet governance, but let's say internet in general. And so, so the multi-stakeholder model, model is offering on a national level to all of you guys the opportunity to, to discuss these issues that you burn for. So, so we're, we're basically offering our hand and please, please take it and, and, and join the discussions and, and let's take this forward to the, uh, the global level. Um, then going back to the, uh, the IGF in Baku, uh, I realized that there were quite a lot of skepticism uh, around going to Baku about the, the situation on freedom of expression and human rights in the country. Um, but correct me if I'm mistaken, but I think that all the, all the NGOs in the country were very welcoming of, of the IGF. They, they saw it as an opportunity for them to go and really express themselves in, in, in this forum. Uh, and on the, um, on the Baku ministerial, I think that was a pre-event. So you shouldn't really link that, the closed session, you shouldn't link it to the, the IGF. Because uh, this year the Indonesians did it as, as a pre-event as well and it was open. It was also closed. So, you know, I don't buy I, I, this pre-event stuff. I think, I think that what happens is that the UN applies different rules and regulations to governments to what it applies to anyone else. I mean, I, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's the price we pay for working within the multilateral system. But I think those semi-closed pre-events where governments come up with statements, usually very bad ones, that are on the IGF website, it's very problematic. Uh, I walked into this, this year's ministerial event without a badge. Well, security <laughs> wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but any, anyway, any, anyway, the, the lack the, of enforcement of rules. Yeah, the Azerbaijanis will be holding a national IGF in Baku uh, next week, so that's also a signal that you know we've been able probably to take something forward nationally there. For information on Baku, the, the uh, Azerbaijani civil society groups actually produced a report which they released in Indonesia on how things have actually deteriorated. Online freedoms are worse now in Azerbaijan than they were prior to the 2012 IGF. Hmm. Question, yes. We've got five more minutes to go. As I said, an hour is way too short for a discussion like this. Um, I'll take one more question. If, we, if there are two more short questions from the audience, then I'd like to, to uh, wrap up with the panelists. Thank you, thank you, uh, good morning. My name is Andrea Beccali, I'm now working for ICANN. I have a question for you that probably helps us in understanding the multi-stakeholder model and more uh, the internet governance frame, framework. So if I'm using Facebook and suddenly I see that someone took a picture of me drunk last night and posted it up, and I don't like that and I want this to go down, well, where do I go? Well, I will go to the local police station and see if the local police station can do something and go probably to the internet service provider or, and then hopefully they can go and send a letter to Menlo Park in California and someone there can decide what to do with that. And uh, that's just an example. There are so many aspects of our daily lives that we don't realize how little control do we have. And, uh, and the way to go to complain and to address issues is completely in, in, in a fog cloud. You don't know where actually you have to go. And, and, and that's something that I'm surprised how much we don't care about that or how much we get used to that, probably because so far the benefits are larger than the losses. 
But um, in, a, in a concrete case, I mean, if you have a website and suddenly you see that your website is hacked, or if you're going to the bank, well, what do you think your bank is a phishing website and, and someone is stealing your money, where do you go? How do you address that? So we, in the ICANN, just to make an example, we try to address some of those issues, uh, ensuring that we can provide a framework where you can, when you can voice your complaint, you can shape the policies and hopefully also have a stake in the final outcome. But that's a little, a little particular tiny bit of the, how the internet works. The other cases that I made are much more larger. They include a much larger variety of actors. So you need to think about structure that in the near future will be able to address all those issues, not only for me, but for the billion of Facebook users and, for the, and that's another layer of complexity because uh, you, here we are going across countries, we are going across time, we are going across different cultures and legislation. So these are issues that I think we should think about, and in the end, when we try to answer those, we, you, we have probably the multi-stakeholder approach which can give us away. Now, that's more than a question, it's a little speech here, but I would like to see <laughs> what you think about that. Thank you. I'd also like to throw the que a question to the audience. How many of you feel like, at this point, the, the benefit outweighs the, the cost, so to speak, of the, the internet? You comfortable enough with the way companies behave, the way the, the legislation in your country to continue your user behaviour? Most of you. How many of you uh, are uncomfortable with, with uh, or have been, have been cross, have been upset about some legislation, some stupid legislation in your country, or, or some stupid policy by one, uh, by one of the companies you, you buy a service from? Um, in the last year or so. And how many of you have done something about it? How many of you have written a letter, participated in a process, raised your voice outside, you know, just the, the coffee, uh, the fika room in, in your house, in your office? A few of you, but not all of you. Okay, so then my question to you is, is um, we've got um, one minute. Um, what would you like the takeaway to be to, to the audience, and where do you hope, what do you hope that the, the internet will have evolved to in, in five, ten years? Two questions to answer in 30 seconds each. I want my kids to have experienced this internet thing in a similar way as I have, as a as a place where you can, well, game, where you can learn, where you can do all these things those keynotes were about over the last few days. Collaborate, game, enjoy, uh, build social fabric, um, and innovate. That's, that's where I want the, in, as, a, as, a, as a good place, as a safe place. Um, how internet governance debate in the next few years is going to shape that, I, I really do not know, but I definitely want to try contribute to that, for instance, by working the ITF, um, where, and I would like to say that, the last ITF um, was after Snowden, and there was a, a, a huge debate in various working groups and gatherings and in the plenary about uh, what to do against pervasive monitoring. And the ITF is actually going through a review. Um, the working groups, the individuals that come to the ITF actually took the initiative to review a lot of the protocols that are being worked at in the ITF and see how you can make them more resistance against uh, pervasive monitoring. For instance, by um, uh, uh, disallowing plain text in the next version of HTML. So only encrypted traffic for HTML. The, the, I just want to add that that discussion is available on YouTube and there were some good interviews as well with the head of, of um, uh, the security area and a few others so and there's some good discussions there so I'd, I would encourage people to go and look at those. Instead of Google. <laughs> uh, all right the takeaway I want uh, everybody to cooperate with us on, on developing the future governance of internet, which is the enabler, as, as, as all have mentioned, and a five to ten year perspective. 
I dare not to think further than the end of 2014. There's so much on the table, but I, I, I hope that we will be able to develop a, a better functioning uh, multi-stakeholder governance of the internet based on the, uh, the existi existing structures. But what, what should they do? Should they come to an IGF? Should they come to their local, local IGF? Should they write to their local parliamentarian? Should they write a letter to the editor? What should they do? Well, I think, as I mentioned earlier, multi-stakeholderism begins at home. So, so get engaged on the national processes, the regional ones, then the global one. Uh, take part in all the, all the national relevant processes and, and get, just get involved. Um, I would like to see the internet recognized as a global public good in international law. And I think that would change everything. Now, that is of all the issues I have raised in the Internet Governance Forum since it started, the one that I've had most pushback on is that one. Not human rights. But when you mention the internet as a global public good, business generally jump up and down, even the technical community. But I think that would really uh, take us forward. Secondly, I'd like to see more diversity. Um, I'd like us to not be so dependent on a few big companies. I'd like us to have more diverse, so interoperable social networking platforms and workspaces and social interaction spaces. And I think we've got open source, we've got developers, and the power of the internet is what users can create and how they shape it. But I think we're at a kind of a junk juncture at the moment where a lot of user innovation and creativity is being channeled through a few large platforms and I think we have the power to stop being so dependent on, on, on those platforms. We shouldn't just blame Facebook and Google, we have choice. Um, and then I think I'd like to see more engagement, I think, I think, I think along the line. I think Andrea, the issue, your Facebook, uh, Facebook example, it's a good one. But my organization was involved recently in negotiating with Facebook about rape videos. And, and we actually won, you know, we said to them, you allow or you don't allow bare breasts. Um, as images on Facebook, but you allowed users to have rape videos in, in, in user groups or user sites. And we actually, you know, after a few negotiations, we, we got them to, to change terms and conditions. So I think it is about engagement. And I don't think it's going to be easy because the internet is vast and it touches on so many different aspects of life. Um, but I think, yes, internet governance um, um, begins at home. Don't be passive. I think that's the most important important thing. As a user of the internet, don't be passive. You can still shape it. Okay. <coughs> and I would like to add a slightly biased suggestion, and that is actually to get involved with ISOC SE, uh, the Swedish chapter of ISOC. This, this is what the ISOC SE um, does, or at least should be doing more of, I think. Um, and I think um, the only way to, to sort of invigorate that debate locally is, is to do it <coughs> well, <coughs> excuse me, like, like you were saying, at home. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, I'd like to thank all the panellists and thank you for the questions. Um, first of all, a round of applause. <coughs>